sadness and regret that we are that I am here today to make this videotape for us to send in lieu of my being present in Spain. As some of you know, I could not be there to deliver this address in person because my husband has recently had heart surgery and it did not seem that I could leave my personal family and my husband of many, many years in order to be with my international family of family therapists to celebrate this very important 30th anniversary of IFTA. I would love to be with you all, and I miss coming to the conferences, but this was a time where I truly felt I had to set my family, my personal family, as my top priority. So I hope that this videotape which is kindly being made by Desiree at the request of Bill Hebert will be a viable substitute. And my thanks to them and Bill and Mary Ann Nichols for arranging this at the University of Georgia Club, Faculty Club. Let's now turn the time clock back 30 some years. I received a call for papers to be submitted for the first East-West Bridging Conference that was to be held in Prague, Czechoslovakia. It was still Czechoslovakia. It looked interesting, and since I was already into traveling around the world to present, it was a country and a region that I wanted to go to. Peter Boss was chair of the conference. He himself was, is from Prague and was a member of the Family Process Board of Directors. Family Process was one of the major sponsors of the conference and because of its international circulation and wonderful reputation, its whole board was there, or much of its board was there, for a board meeting and to support the conference. The honorary chairs were Virginia Satir and Don Block, both of whom played a very active role in the conference. I decided to submit a paper on the self of the therapist because I felt that was the title that would appeal to therapists across the world, each of them struggling with their personal and professional identity in a rapidly changing world. And it was better for me than talking about the dynamics of families or how to do treatment, because there are some variations from country to country. I was delighted that it was accepted and looked forward to making the trip with my husband to Prague. Some interesting sidelights were that um, a friend of mine who was there from the States, who had done a good deal of research in Prague, said to me when we were walking in the park the first day, don't say anything in the room of any political implications. We think that many of the rooms in the hotel may be bugged. That turned out to be excellent advice, and I learned when I was it, behind the Iron Curtain to always be careful in the rooms and even in uh, vehicles driving because one never knew what was bugged and who was nearby, and I learned to walk turning my head to make sure that uh, no one was within listening distance. We also found out that uh, the government had put a great deal of pressure on Peter Boss and the rest of the committee and wondered why they were hosting this conference. 
This was a very different time, but despite the feeling of being watched and not being completely safe, the spirit at the conference was absolutely marvelous. We were all glad to meet each other. The papers submitted reflected a highly um, different kind of audience than we would have at an AMFT conference or other regional conferences, country conferences. It was wonderful to meet with colleagues formally at the sessions as well as informally. And it was a high-spirited conference. The last night of the conference, the committee hosted a farewell party and invited all of those from the conference committee, the Family Process Editorial Board, and those who had presented. It was held in a castle that we had passed, which looked very unimpressive because it was still all gray. But when we went inside, it was a beautiful conference with Czech crystal chandeliers and very ornate. And they did it upright. Now somewhere about the middle of the evening, Judith Wertheimer from um, Israel and um, one of the women from England came over to me and said, this has been such a marvelous conference. The whole idea of the East-West interchange has been so excellent. We can't not continue this. Let's put together uh, something that we can do this again. I immediately resonated with the idea, and I said, I think you're talking about an international organization. And they affirmed that. Now, since Virginia was in the, uh, at the party, and she was someone with whom I had formed an excellent relationship, I went over with them, and we told Virginia what we wanted to do. And she said, terrific, I think it's, it's time has come. She already had the International Secure Organization, but that served people primarily of uh, a secure orientation, communications. And so I said, Virginia, would you do it? And she said, no, I'm already not feeling well. I'm old. But Flory, you're known in many countries around the world. You're respected. You have the ability and the energy. Why don't you do it? And they agreed, and I was sort of anointed to take it on. And we had about an hour left to do the organizing. So several of us walked around and we went to people from different countries who we knew were the leaders in those countries. And by the end of the evening, we had a steering committee of 10 people from 10 countries. And we got permission from Peter Boss, who we had asked to be on the steering committee, to all be on stage at the final plenary and to announce the formation of IFTA. That's how we were born. And we got up on stage and did that. And uh, one of the principles we established then is that the organization was open to anyone who was interested they could be family therapists, they could be students, they could be relatives of other therapists who supported the idea and to retain that kind of openness of spirit. We also thought in terms of not expecting certain degrees because the training in different countries and the levels expected are so different. And I think that principle still holds. At any rate, many people responded very positively, but as always, there were some that were disappointed and wondered how come we were the ones doing it and not them.
and some of that rivalry continued for a while. They never joined. Interestingly, I've been able to uh, find a piece of the original stationery listing the offices, officers and the board. And we started out with 15, although 10 were there that night. Uh, I was elected first and founding president. Max von Trommel from Holland was vice president. Janet Walker, who was the other person, along with Judith Wertheimer from England, was our secretary, and Gabor Keitner uh, was treasurer. The members at large were Peter Boss from Czechoslovakia, Janos Bordy from Hungary, Romando Macias from Mexico, Maria Orwid from uh, Krakow, Poland, Virginia Satir from the U.S., Verena Shores Owen from West Germany, Lita Schwartz from the USA, Leonard Siegel from Australia, Carl Tom, Canada, Jarl Wallstrom from uh, Finland, Judith Wertheimer from Israel, and later on, on the stationery, we have the name of our legal counsel, who is Stuart Klein, my lawyer in Florida, who drew up with me the bylaws and also filed for us to be a recognized organization. Interestingly, the original 10 people each contributed $100 and we began with a budget of $1,000, and we ran IFTA out of my home office for several years. We did not have professional staff, although I used my secretary as uh, the administrative assistant. Very different than what we have with IFTA now, <laughs> with a staff office and a well-qualified executive director. Interestingly, another major difference was this was really before the iPhone. <laughs> um, the telephone was used sparingly because we didn't have much of a budget and we had occasional conference calls, but having those across 10 or 12 different countries was very expensive. So we did everything by letter. It also predated the kind of use of email that we do today. So we were on a limited budget. Nonetheless, one of the things that we did was to set up a collecting uh, service with one of our members in London at the London Family Institute. And all of us who had books to donate would pay to send them to him, and then they were distributed to countries that needed them, to their libraries. The second thing that we did was many of us donated videotapes. And I'll never forget the day that I got an email from someone asking for videotapes, which we sent, and then he wrote to me and said, but you forgot to send the projector and the camera. And at that point, I said, that equipment we don't provide. There were always uh, unexpected developments like that. That service continued for many years. Also, initially, we started with everybody paying the same dues. And then we quickly learned that there were many people who simply couldn't afford the $25 or $50 dues that we started with. And so we used uh, one of the international fee scales from uh, either the United Nations or one of the other ones that groups countries in three categories and the dues were prorated according to the country that the person belong to or came from. 
Our initial membership was made up not only from the countries that I mentioned, but we rapidly expanded in countries like Greece and Italy, Norway, the Scandinavian countries came aboard. And uh, by the second and third boards, we had members from Brazil, Chile, and Argentina. We were slow, and uh, we also had members from India who were active on the board, and Japan. We were slow in getting uh, members from the African countries, except for South Africa, where we had members quite early. Okay, now, let me go over quickly for you where the first conferences were held, because uh, I think, again, it represents the wide draw that IFTA had. And that the question that Bill had asked me to address, Bill Hebert, was why did we form? I hope I've answered that, but let me uh, elaborate further. We found that the exchange at the first conference was so enriching and so stimulating we felt the time had come to share what we all knew with one another, to really have a forum to look at how families were different depending on the other institutions that we find in all societies, which are the political institution, the educational, the uh, economic, and the social. And one of the major differences we've seen in our work around the world is that those cultures that are primarily individualistic in terms of their emphasis rather than uh, familistic or uh, really differ in terms of the value systems, how we raise our children, our expectations of their loyalty, whether they put the family first or pursuit of individual values first. And this was a wonderful forum for looking at those differences. Also the tribal families, so that we became much more aware of the variety of family forms and expectations. And as we've seen increases in immigration again, we continue to see that as we learn when we treat families not to have similar expectations of all of them and to respect the values and the ethics and the traditions they bring with them. Okay, so it took us a year and a half to uh, organize our first conference, which was in Dublin. And the format that we used initially was that we asked members to put in bids through their local or national organization to be the host. So uh, in Ireland, there was a fairly strong family therapy association, and they hosted it. And it was wonderful. We got to see the main library there, which has the Book of Kells, which is a wonderful book. We got to the Irish Theater, and we um, the Irish group was high-spirited with some very controversial members, and that led to a very exciting first IFTA conference. <laughs> I remember going to Ireland ahead of time to talk with them and work with them. And I then uh, made a trip to Krakow, Poland, since our board member from Krakow, Maria Orley, had asked to host that conference. We had an active group in Krakow at the University Medical School. And uh, that was a very, very interesting conference. I remember they're putting us up in a uh, boarding house when we went there and having to walk three flights of steps 
because uh, that's just the way it was. And there was uh, often no electricity. You'd plug something in and it wouldn't work. And there were many things we were not alerted to in advance wherever we went at that time. Our next conference was hosted in Yavaskala, Finland. That is the correct pronunciation. Our board member, Jarl Wastrom, worked on that with Yuka Altanon, who became a member of our uh, international, of our Journal of Family Psychotherapy. And uh, both Jarl and uh, Yuka collaborated with one another and had a very strong program in family therapy in Yavaskala. The next year, 1992, was in Tel Aviv, Israel, and there was an, a very strong Israeli Family Therapy Association, and people like Israel Charney then came on the board, and he became a later president. 1993 was in Amsterdam, Holland, and 1994 was in Budapest, Hungary. So you can see that we very much went to the Eastern countries. Budapest was particularly for me uh, a notable conference because Cynthia Corral, who was an Israeli psychiatrist that was active in IFTA, who had grown up initially in Argentina, asked me one day when we were having dinner, either in Tel Aviv, I think a year in Tel Aviv, why I went to Germany, given that I'm Jewish and uh, I was so interested in the Holocaust, they, the Israelis couldn't understand. And I said, because I felt that it was important that people in Germany hear about and they'll still study under people who are Jewish, see that we come, see that we're normal. And at, at every presentation I made there, I did something on the Holocaust. And she said to us thoughtfully, she was out to dinner with my husband and I, would you be willing to put together a Holocaust discussion group between our German and Israeli members. And in my impetuous way, I said yes, <laughs> not realizing quite what we were starting. And so we asked our Hungarian delegation if we could do that at the Hungarian conference. And they said yes with the proviso that one third of those attending had to be from Hungary because our Hungarian members were faced with, some of them found out that they were Jewish, although they had not known that and were raised as, as Protestant. And the others were treating Jewish survivors and didn't know enough about it. So in Hungary, we did our first Holocaust dialogue group one-third Israeli, which later became Israeli or Jewish, one-third German, and one-third Hungarian, uh, Hungarian. And that set a pattern. We had 10 Holocaust survivor groups over the following years at IFTA conferences. They were always extremely emotional. Some of, uh, some of the Jewish people would come in and say, I don't know if I can sit in this room with some of these German members who killed my ancestors. And I remember going around because each person had to tell their story and holding some of our German members while they did a retelling of what it was like to grow up as a child of a Nazi official. The group was very touching. I was later asked by the Shoah Project if they could sit in and tape a session. 
And I said, no, because I realized, even though I had been taped for show personally, that this would expose some of our people to their parents being prosecuted. And I, we had a vow of confidentiality, and I felt that had to take precedence. These are some of my most uh, poignant memories of being involved with IFTA. And just one final note on the Holocaust survivor group. The rule was you had to participate, you had to have a Holocaust history. And at our last group that I think was in Finland, in Reykjavik, a young man walked in and I said, do you have a survivor history? He said, not a, a survivor of a perpetrator or a victim, but yes. And I said, what was your history? And he said his father was a liberator. And so he shared much in common with the children of uh, survivors because his father also would not talk about the experience. Whenever he was silent or nasty, uh, he, the mother made excuses, that's because of what your dad experienced in liberating the, uh, the camps. And so he sat in and added another note to what we did. That was the last meeting as we felt we had fairly well covered the topic. And I continue to hear from many of the members. A couple of our German members became staunch advocates of teaching about the Holocaust in their own country. So I think that was a wonderful um, service that we offered. Okay, after Budapest was our huge conference that was ultra successful in Guadalajara, Mexico. And uh, one memory there is our going around dancing and doing some of the line dances that we did at the Mexican conference that were such fun. We then had a great conference in Athens, Greece, and that too was well attended with all of the uh, enthusiasm and noisiness of our Greek colleagues. We went back to Israel in 1977, 1997, this time in Jerusalem, and everyone had a chance to go to the wall to visit the Arab quarter, the Jewish quarter. And the following year, we went to Dusseldorf, Germany. One of the things that we did at many of our conferences, and I'm particularly thinking now of Israel and then Germany, was that we often had dancing at our social events. And for me, one of the international languages we all speak is the language of music and dance. So we might not be able to speak to each other, but we could dance together, hold hands, and feel that we're in unison. I remember when our Israeli colleagues said in Germany, I never thought I could come back to Germany, and I was concerned. And our German colleagues answered that they also didn't know how they would be treated in Israel. So the level of understanding from those kinds of experiences is much deeper. 1999, we were in Akron at the US. It was our first US conference. And that was quite good. And I'm only going to go to 2000 when we had a very exciting conference in Norway, our first in Scandinavia. I, I probably should uh, include 201, which was in Porto Alegre, Brazil, which is when we began going more to Latin America. Somewhere along the line, we started having editors' meetings at the conference. 
and we tried to get editors from all of the major family journals around the world. It's interesting to know that, be, that before many of our well-known American journals, um, other than family process began, that there was a family journal in uh, Norway known as Focus Pothamillion. There was an early family journal uh, in Japan. And um, I had the honor of being on many of the editorial boards, Japan, Norway, <coughs> Italy, and enjoying that very much. Our foreign journals often would have at least the introduction translated into English. Our English journals rarely have anything translated into a foreign language. But those of us on editorial boards knew that we needed to do much more editing and, and rewriting on articles submitted from colleagues in other countries. So the editors' meetings became a way where those who were more experienced helped those starting new journals on how to do it, what to look for, how to put together a board. And many people have trouble when they put a board together, teaching a board how to reject articles that aren't good. Editors' meetings are still going on. I think there's going to be one in Malaga. Another thing that we tried always to do at the beginning was to have a very strong board. And initially, we went for as many people who were prominent from different countries because we felt they could bring in members. That seems to be less true. But the having of international leaders like Luigi Boscolo uh, from Italy was always an attraction. And it was wonderful for those of us on the board to work together. Initially, we had individual and group members. I think that no longer is the case. Is it, Bill? Do we Practically have speaking, no. No. OK. There were countries <coughs> where we felt a group could, uh, could join where they couldn't afford individual memberships. So we had a separate category. Um, let's see. The IFTA story continues to unfold. I think it will for a long time, although uh, the first and second generation of leadership uh, is no longer as visible. The training function of IFTA continues. Again, it has been transformed. But it continues, and I gather that the newest addition is that uh, various countries are asking IFTA to help them with certification. Again, recognizing that the standards have to be different and helping them to become certified by standards that make sense in that particular country. There have been in IFTA's history some schisms which have evolved, but by and large, the feeling of connection and connectedness and working together on behalf of the changing families around the world has continued to be its focus. And I'm so proud to be part of IFTA 30 years later. <laughs> Have a wonderful conference.